Yes, hello everybody and welcome to the 89th Giro d'Italia. Phil Liggett alongside me, Paul Sherwin. And no, we're not looking at Italy. In fact, we're looking at Serain in Belgium, the scene of the first individual time trial of this year's race. And uh, we're in the month of May. And in fact, four days of the Tour of Italy will be spent here in Belgium before the long transfer on Wednesday will take us to the new start town in Italy of Platenza. Paul, individual time trial, not too long, just around about seven kilometres. As we watch the riders here signing in. It's a very good field list. The defending champion is Paolo Savadelli, the Discovery Channel rider. Brings a strong team about him. Paolo Bettini here, former champion of Italy. Gilberto Simone also here. And also we're interested in the whereabouts of the big sprinter, Robbie McEwen who seems to always use the Giro d'Italia, Paul, for his trainer, here he is, for his training uh, for the Tour de France. Well, Robbie McEwen, I think, as always, is going to look at this race to uh, ride well over the first 10 to 14 days and then move away once we get into the big mountain passes because as far as Robbie McEwen is concerned, this is preparation for the Tour de France. Now, there is a two-kilometre climb on the course. It's quite a technical course, this. The weather is rather nice. And uh, Savadelli is last year's winner. He'll be the last to start. There's Gilberto Simoni. Former double winner of this event, Ivan Basso, smiling and on form. So they say, let's get out on course. This is Paolo Savadelli. Bradley McGee has finished in best time. He's won the prologue in the Tour of Italy before, giving him uh, Amalia Rosa. But now this is looking a very, very good time by Paolo Savadelli. Something of a surprise, he has won prologues before and it looks as though he's going to open with a bang here. He's well inside the time of McGee, 7.50, 11 seconds better and just on 30 miles an hour his average speed. But he always says he can turn out a good prologue and this today has given him a, a Maglia Rosa. Well, let's not forget, just before the start of the Giro d'Italia, he was the winner of the prologue of the Tour of Romandie as well. Well, there's the result, 7 minutes 50, Brad McGee at 11 seconds, Gutierrez 13, Schumacher in fourth, and Sergei Gonchar, former world time trial champion, slotting in in fifth place. But carrying on the way he finished one year ago, he pulls on the first leader's jersey of this year's Giro d'Italia. Now the open road starts tomorrow, and that'll take us on the stage from Mons to Charlois. A ride of just over 200 kilometres, and already Discovery Channel have the leader on their squad. Two hundred and three kilometres over one hundred and twenty six miles. Uh, and this is the area of Belgium. And let's not forget Robin McEwen in the field here. Loves Belgium. He loves the area. He lives here when he's uh, at home. Otherwise, he's back home in Queensland, Australia. Charleroi is the destination, the famous finish town. Eric Zabel once won a stage of the Tour de France there. And that was on his birthday. Not really too much for the riders to worry about here this afternoon. A fairly testing course, but as always, uh, celebrations of birthdays on these Grand Tours. And today it's the 33rd birthday of Paolo Salvadelli. And I don't think Phil is going to be too happy with the weather conditions. Well, the candles won't stay alight in the weather, that's for sure, because here, as you can see, the rain is coming down. You'll never dampen the enthusiasm, though, of the Belgian public because this is their number one sport. Paolo Bettini, he won't like this, although he is a man for this area because he's won Liege Baston Liege, of course. Well, as expected, the field are all heading into town together here. And now, can Freddy Rodriguez, the American on the team, try and get Robbie McEwen into the thick of the action? Well, I just caught a glimpse of McEwen there wearing number 75. It's Milram all over the front end of the main field. You see how dangerous it is coming into these Belgian towns. A, a lot of traffic furniture on the road. Milram all over the front end of this main field. Looking back to see the whereabouts of Alessandro Pataki. That's the man they're trying to set out for the win this afternoon. Ali Jet, as they call him, here's the man with the fastest legs. Robbie McEwen shows him no respect, though, and will take him on if he can here. The first big challenge of this year's Giro d'Italia, the mountains, of course, they're waiting for the riders when we go down into Italy. But right now, this should be the domain of the sprinters. And so it's proving here at the end of this long stage today. 
No breakaways of significance. And Milram trying to launch Ali Jett. You probably noticed there, Paul. McEwen is locked onto his back wheel. Right on his wheel there in sixth position is Robin McEwen waiting for the moment to see whether or not Alexandra Pataki makes a mistake coming into the final kilometre. But nobody will battle with Robin McEwen. He might be a small rider, a small sprinter, but I tell you what, he has no fear at all of rubbing shoulders with some men who are a lot bigger than him. Last kilometre. As they open up the sprint now, he's still got plenty of riders to lead him out here as he tries for the line. It should be a formality, this, for Alessandro Pataki because his team is strong and they're still holding him there in that fourth place. McEwen resting very calmly there, right on his shoulder there. It looks as though we've got Olaf Pollock of the T-Mobile team just holding him on the inside. The Rabobank rider there is Graham Brown, also locked in. He knows a good wheel to follow, his arch-rival from Australia. McEwen and still they're going, and Ali Jett is being led now to the line. Marco Velo leading him out, looking exactly where he is here. Last desperate moments as they come up on the inside of the crowd. At 300 metres now, this should be a formality. Alessandro Pataki is purposely uh, poised here, and right behind him is Robbie McEwen. McEwen now breaking, and it looks as though Pataki looking all around has come up on the inside, he completely boxed out of it. That is Pollock who's got over the top and through on the inside. They've washed Pataki away. This is a stage win at number nine in the Giro d'Italia history for Robbie McEwen and early blood. He will be delighted with that and whatever happened to Pataki because it was perfect. Well, it was very confusing coming into that last 40 or 50 metres, but that's what Robbie McEwen enjoys. He likes the confusion of a dangerous sprint to find his way through the little gaps that appear and all of a sudden hugging the barriers just watch McEwen here, he looks under his arm there to see right behind him Alessandro Pataki made a fatal mistake there, coming up through the middle in the golden helmet there is Paolo Bettini but McEwen gets that one easily and I think he'll be happy getting a win on Belgian soil it's come early too, if you ask me, because it looked perfect there for Pataki. He faded into fourth place. McEwen almost five hours the ride today, uh, getting the win over Olaf Pollock, who's a very good finish on T-Mobile. Bettini also proving again he can mix with the best sprinters there in third place. Well, there's Ewan McEwen. Oh, dear, he's not learned how to throw the flowers like Dad just yet, or the teddy bird or whatever it is. And um, McEwen here... That's his ninth ever stage win in the Giro d'Italia, but no change in the overall. Savadelli still stays ahead of McGee with his prologue difference of 11 seconds and Gutierrez there in third place. No change at all overall, as we expected. There he is, Paolo Savadelli, the man in pink. He keeps his Maglia Rosa. Of course, the Giro d'Italia, and he can climb, will threaten in the next to a weekend coming up of this three-week race. Day three, stage three of the Giro d'Italia. We stay in Belgium today as we head towards Namur. I think Paul Sherwin's raced up to the Citadel finish there before, haven't you, Paul? Well, that was a long time ago of the Grand Prix of the Wallonie. I finished actually third up there behind a man by the name of Frank Hoster. The riders face a fairly testing course down towards the end. So they've got the Côte de Anin at the end, and that's one of the climbs of the very famous Flèche Wallon. And, of oh. course, well, this is Alessandro Pataki, Phil, who's gone down very hard. The weather conditions at the start of the Giro d'Italia have not been great this year and Pataki looks very injured there well this is a flashback in fact he had a fall and he's injured his knee in fact and it's not very pleasant at all he's got his teammates around him now they're going to limp on because the race is heading towards the famous fortress finish in Namur a lot of teammates have waited here to try and nurse him through to the finish but it doesn't look at all good here doesn't look very good at all for Alessandro Pataki and his teammates alongside him. This man is in a serious amount of pain here, Phil. He's got teammates there encouraging to try and ride again. This is the race that all of the Italians love, and I can't believe, Phil, that he's going to abandon the race here. Well, he's thinking about it, that's for sure. He's not a man that gives up easily. The team here are in discussion. This isn't looking at all good for Alessandro Pataki, and this is only the second day of real racing, remember. Stage one was the time trial. Well, There's actually, the old freezing spray going on to try and get him to the finish. Yeah, he's, he's going to be in a lot of pain, this man here. They've got the special spray on there to try and take a little bit of the pain away. The race doctor's having a look at that, but a little bit further up, this is the arrival towards the summit here of the uh, Côte de Namur. And this is José Luis Rubiera, and you can, as you can see, it's a very nasty little cobbled climb. 
Yes, yeah, so well, that's a good move by Ribeira here from the Team Discovery, taking a bit of pressure away from Savadelli. The riders staying back with Patacado, Lorenzetto, Rigotto and on Ongarato. They'll try and nurse him back home. These are the slippery stones of the twist and turns up to the top of the citadel here. Well, Chechu has got a slight advantage over the front end of the group, but I just caught a very close glimpse there of the golden helmet of Paolo Bettini. This is a very good finish for a man like Bettini, and in fact, he's been swept away there. This is a rider from Gerolsteiner. Yeah, that looks like it's uh, Schumacher who's come up there. Well, Rubiera's got company there. You can see Paolo Bettini inside now. The Flamme Rouge, 1,000 metres to go. This is a very slippery finish here. Right on the wheel of Chechu Rubiera is Schumacher. Right behind, they seem to be slowing down a fraction. They're spreading out over the road. This is the moment I would expect to see a move coming from Paolo Bettini because he loves this kind of finish. Well, Stefan Schumacher made his move midway up. He's reached Rubiera, and I think he's given Rubiera just enough to hold him off at 800 metres. In that group behind is Philippe Gilbert. Jens Voigt is there. Bettini, as Paula said, is there as well. This is an extraordinarily good ride here by the Gerolsteiner man. He won the Circuit de la Sarthe in France by 32 hundredths of a second this year, just snatching the overall, but not winning any of the stages. Now he's out for revenge here on the climb to Namur from France over to Belgium as Schumacher tries to hold off. I don't think Rubiera now can have the strength. He's just about got the strength to hang on. Look at the tongue out there of Schumacher. This is a very difficult finish, swinging round the corner there. You don't take too many risks at 450 metres to go because those cobblestones are extremely slippery. Chechu Rubiera in second position. It looks as if Paolo Bettini's coming across the gap. The golden helmet of the Olympic champion trying to reach these two riders. I had to take my hat off to Rubiera because he's beaten, but he's hanging on. He knows he's good for second here. It's been a good move by the Discovery team to put somebody away. Wasn't quite good enough as the chase now lines up. This is going to be all the way to the line here to 150 metres to go. This left-hand bend, absolutely treacherous. And Rubiera, no answer here to Stefan Schumacher, who gets his first actual win of the year on the road, crossing the line there. There ahead of Rubier, there'll be a time difference as well. Bettini gets best of the rest, I think, and Gilbert and Voigt were in there as well. Now, there might well be, because these timed gaps are here, I think, in fact, there will be a change of overall leadership. Well, there were certainly time gaps there, Phil, looking back, but for Schumacher, he's not too worried about that. What he was worried about was getting himself the win here this afternoon at the top of a very difficult ascent of the Citadel de Namur. Well, the uh, traumas of the day all over his face here for Stefan Schumacher, the German. A good victory for Gerolsteiner, two seconds over Rubiera, six over Rebellin, Bettini as they cross the line there, and Gilbert, Voigt and Maletta was the other man. Now, those time gaps, I think, will give uh, Schumacher the race lead. We'll wait for confirmation. Let's get the stage victor out of the way first. Well, this young man, just 25 years of age, he rode a very good classic season as well because he finished ninth, Phil, and in fact he has got the overall lead by 13 seconds, and that's because of the time bonuses over Paolo Salvadelli. So that will be a great coup for him and, of course, for Team Gerolsteiner. They're now the men in pink. Yes, onwards to stage number four, 400 kilometres under the saddle, our last day in Belgium today, and just under 200 kilometres as we race down to Hotton from Vanza. Well, a light, slightly more testing course today over the Côte de Wain, the Côte de Haute-Levé, which is uh, one of the climbs of Liège-Bastogne-Liège, not too far away from the Francochon motor racing circuit and then charging down into the outskirts of the town of Autant. It should be a day for big breakaways, but in fact, there's a large group of riders charging into town. As we rejoin the action here, we're just over a kilometre from the line here. It's been a traditional day of attack and counter-attack, but the field ready for the Ardennes today. They've all regrouped here. And they're now facing up to a situation where the sprinters are going to have their day again. Sadly, the Pataki, who did finish, by the way, is now out of this race, returning to Italy with quite a badly damaged uh, knee, and it looks like he could well miss the upcoming Tour de France. Well, just looking, in fact, Phil, it was Team Milram on the front end of the main field, and I'm not really sure who they're trying to lead it out for here, because with Alessandro Pataki gone, this is a team without a leader, but they've still decided to get to the front, keep the pace nice and high. Robbie McEwen's got a couple of teammates up alongside him there. You can see he's right up there in fifth position. He's looking pretty good. 
Well, thankfully, the roads have dried out after another battering through the reins of the Ardennes into the last kilometre now. It's a first ever finish here in Hoton, of course, as the riders now fan out. And this surely now with out of the way Pataki, Robbie McEwen is going to find that his challenges will come from elsewhere. How is he going to read this one now as he starts to look for the moves? as he starts to come up to the line here now. A couple of riders up there from F. De Jure, they're in the white jerseys. They may well be trying to do something for Philippe Gilbert. You know, he's a man from this part of Belgium, although he rides for a French team. You've got on the right-hand side the pink jerseys. They are T-Mobile trying to get Olaf Pollack up there for a win. But look at this, this is side by side. They're really lining it up here. Well, in fact, Team Milram are leading each other out here with no obvious reason for it because they haven't got any great sprinters left on their team. Pollock is the rider on the far left and having a go here as they try to come through the middle now, and this is going to be a battle. Thomas Veitkus is the AG2R rider, but McEwen again has turned on the style. He won't believe this start to the Giro d'Italia. That's his 10th ever stage win now in the Giro and his second in only four days of racing. I'm a bit surprised as well because we went over some pretty tough climbs early on, like the Côte d'Ouen, like the Haute Levée, but all of the sprinters seem to pull themselves back together. But Robbie McEwen again coming out of the chaos, which was the front end of the main field, and that's what he thrives on. He thrives on the danger and the excitement. Two wins in Belgium. He can probably stay at home now. And, uh, well, he won't want to stay at home. He's now going to move on. Tomorrow is a rest day, but it's a travel day, really, for the riders. They move in to Italy for a team time trial from Piacenza. But there's the sprint now, very determined finish. McEwen again just gritting his teeth. Henk Vogels is the rider saying, there you are, Robbie, what a lead out I've just given you. And McEwen gets it. This pocket dynamo ahead of Paolo Bettini and Lotto getting the third place there. Well, Robbie is a great sprinter, taking to the line Paolo Bettini, who should keep his lead, I would think, in the most consistent rider. And here in the Giro d'Italia, that's the Maglia Ciclamina. And he is a man who is certainly looking for that. That I think right up there, you can see the gap that Robin McEwen's got. He really has enjoyed that victory. Well, it shouldn't make any difference yet on the points leaders, Jersey. Schumacher was right there too, so he should keep his lead in the points. But it's going to be close between him and McEwen now. Changing the King of the Mountains today as well. Sandy Kassar has got the lead in that after his journey through the Ardennes today. Just look at Paolo Bettini coming up here, though, finding a little bit of a gap to come up through the middle of everybody there. Gets himself second place in the lunge for the line, thinking to himself, ah, that could have been mine, but it's not. It's Robbie McEwen's. And there he is, all smiles, twice on the podium already, four days only. Now the journey into Italy, and that's where the race will continue, and that's where the mountains await, of course. Stefan Schumacher just hangs on, 13 seconds over Savadelli. Rebellin up in third place and uh, Gutierrez in fourth. Pretty much the same order, the same names that uh, triumphed on day one in the prologue time trial. Schumacher just breaking the routine. He's sprinting very, very well and he gets a second day in the Malia Rosa. He's taking it now to Italy. <laughs> A 38-kilometre team time trial opens the race here in Italy now after the long transfer yesterday. And the riders now, having covered more than 600 kilometres on Belgian roads, uh, face up now to Italian roads. And uh, needless to say, Paul, the weather has changed. Well, this is what the riders, I think, have been waiting for. And poor old Alessandro Pataki. They are saying, in fact, that Alessandro Pataki has broken his kneecap into about five pieces. And that's going to take him, Phil, an awful lot time, long time to get back into racing. And all he can do now is enjoy the Giro d'Italia on TV. As we look here at the race route, the riders moving away from Piacenza. It's a fairly flat course, 44 kilometres in total. And it should, in fact, I would expect, create a change in the overall classification. One of the big teams, one of the specialists of this kind of discipline, of course, will be Team Discovery Channel, maybe trying to get the lead back for Paolo Salvadelli. And Lance Armstrong, by the way, is reportedly arriving on the race today. This is the first team time trial since 1989 in the Tour of Italy. It's got a tailwind as well as sun today, so we should see some fast times. This is the team of uh, Paolo Salvadelli, of uh, Schumacher. Stefan Schumacher, the Gerolsteiner squad, making their start. Well, Schumacher right in there. It's very important to take a fairly steady start here. The time of uh, Francaise de Jeu is the time to beat, 37 minutes and 56 seconds. And Liquigas, surprisingly to me, Phil, are actually looking to go inside of that. 
Well, this is going I think they're going to get inside too. They're coming up towards the finish. Time as always in team time trials. Taken on the fifth ride of the team to cross the line. That's why they fan out and the clock will stop on the fifth time as they come over just inside by 18 seconds. So that's a good marker there for Leaky Gas. Yeah, but look at the average speed, 55.8 kilometres an hour. Now, that will be important for them. And there's Lance Armstrong in the team car of Team Discovery. I was just going to say important for Danilo De Luca, but Armstrong has made the visit down here. He watched the team in Belgium, flew down there in the private Gulfstream, may I add, to assist in this, in this in team time trial, a discipline that he himself always adored. Well, staying incognito in the squad. This is the lineup here of Discovery Channel. Off to a great start with Savadelli. We're expecting a lot out of Tommy Danielson as well. And Vyacheslav Yekimov riding out his final year. And uh, what an incredible bike rider he has been. This is further out on the course now with Team CSC here. CSC looking well drilled there. You can see them keeping in a big long line. It's important to practice this discipline to find out just exactly which order of riders you want to adopt because every rider goes through in a different way in, an, in, in a team time trial like this. And some riders go through with such a violent acceleration, it really hurts the climbers. And to win a team time trial, you have to get 100% out of every individual man in the squad. Working away here, T-Mobile. They're also looking very positive at the moment as they continue to drive on here because they're carrying uh, some riders well up in the overall. The best man at the moment is the former world time trial champion, Sergei Gonchar. Jan Ulrich in here as well. Well, Ulrich looking for some form in the Giro d'Italia. Hasn't really shown any form at all this season and everybody wondering whether or not he's going to be competitive. There he is. Just Looks as though he's a bit open mouthed at the back of the race there. Not Swinging surprised. up to the finish. Violent effort for him, but this is Team CSC. Time to beat is Liquid Gas, and they're well inside of that. Still inside of 37 wow. minutes at this point. This is a big result for Ivan Basso, the projected race leader here. And Basso comes home well with that team. Good gains here, I think. 57 kilometres an hour and a 42 second beating. So that is a big result here, and he could have stolen a bit of valuable time. Let's see how they're comparing with Discovery Channel. This is the check at 22.4. They're 37 seconds off the pace. Well, that's a bit of a surprise because that's a discipline that they do like here. There's big Jan Ulrich going through there, a little bit further back. It was a quick glimpse there. It looked like uh, the world time trial champion Michael Rogers. Well, Rogers uh, says to be concentrating more on getting his honing his road racing skills now because he's been for three years the world time trial champion. There he is. It looks superb on a machine. These guys really are going very fast. Now, T-Mobile know that they've got to put in a fine performance here this afternoon. The team they want to dislodge off the top spot is, of course, Team CSC. And they're going to go very close to that. They're around about uh, a, a kilometre to go to the close. finish. But I don't think they'll do it, Phil, because it's an awful long finishing straight for these riders. CSC there have got the time of 36 minutes and 56 seconds. And these guys are now starting to look a little bit ragged. They're down to five men. And let's not forget, in a team time trial, it's the time of the fifth rider. That's Jan Ulrich, though, still sitting on the back, number 219. Well, this is going to be desperately close, I'll tell you, because 36-56, they can see the finish here. They know there's only five of them. They can't afford to split this one up now because the last man, the time counts. You may as well slow down and pick him up because it won't stop as he starts to come off the back here. And this looks as though it's Kessler who is having trouble hanging on, but that's where the time is because there are only four riders, I think, in front. It looks like there might be five in the shadows there. I think there's only four as they race up towards the line. Look at the time as they count down. That fifth time is going to be crucial hits the line now and you know what if he'd have finished on the tail they would have won that that would have been so close he really battled there he is 213 Matthias Kessler and he's the man who stopped the clock that's the way it works in the team oh. time trial and I think he realizes he may well have lost it for the team there this is Gerald Steiner they've been out on the road for 30 minutes now and they're trying to keep the pink jersey on the shoulders of Stefan Schumacher there he is just at the back of the line still looking for Fairly organised as a team. Well, they were almost a minute adrift at the checks there on uh, CSC and Mobile, T-Mobile, so I don't think they're going to recover that sort of a time gap. Here comes Discovery Channel now heading in towards the finishing line. They're close, but I think the time will go past 36.56. They're a bit too far out for this. Uh, but again, Discovery Channel are going to be up amongst the podium finishes with this ride.
Looks like big Pavel Padranos there, just uh, dropping off the front, the largest figure in this group here. Tommy Danielson's in the group, Yatislav Ekimov as well, trying to keep themselves up there, but they're not going to go best team here this afternoon because that time has already gone by. They're looking at the time of Liquid Gas, which is third position. They may well, they should do that, though. And there's a lot of riders here for Discovery Tour. They've ridden well as a team, but that's how they train. It's all for one and one for all. In this case, they're all racing with Paolo Savadelli. He is in there as well, just hanging off the back. Here's Ekimov now. This used to be his forte, but the older age is catching up. It won't matter because the top five get the result as they race up to the line with Paolo Sabadelli showing still got good speed here in the time trial. Just slipping away, challenging third place here, should get it on the line. So they slot in with third best time, 37-35. There's Salvadelli wearing number one. Uh, not surprising though, Phil, that uh, Yekimov uh, dropped off the back a fraction, 40 years old at the start of this season. You've got to say that man has had a very long, illustrious career. Absolutely, and very, very popular man. Didn't speak a word of English at one time, but now he speaks it with an American accent, of course, because he rides a lot for the American teams. Armstrong rates him very highly indeed. Gettelsteiner down on course. They're carrying Schumacher. Desperate finish this because Sergei Gonchar in T-Mobile is the obvious next candidate now for the Malia Rosa, unless Gettelsteiner can get within a few seconds of that team. Well, there they are coming into the finishing straight. You can see the haze, the heat haze that has come down to the Giro d'Italia after the very wet start in the four, four days we spent in Belgium. And now we are looking at the time of Discovery Channel. And I think Gerald Steiner have cracked over the second part of this course, Phil. And I think we're yeah. going to see a serious change in the overall classification it's this evening. It's gone already. Yeah, Gerald Steiner's time compared here with Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel are 39 seconds behind uh, Team CSC. 38 behind T-Mobile. That alone is enough to cost Schumacher the jersey here. So the next candidate looks like being uh, a man who's worn it before. In fact, the Ukrainian, Sergei Gonchar. He will be sitting pretty here because Schumacher is riding out of this. The team haven't been strong enough. Look at this now. They're looking at the time of Francaise de Jeu and they might well slot him behind them as they head up towards the line. There's the deviation for the cars. And they're going to fall away, and they're going to finish this ride in sixth place by the look of it. So it's uh, down and out for Gettelsteiner for the moment at least. Still an awful long way to go. But at least Schumacher had two days in pink. And let's not forget the team that laid the solid foundation. Not going to climb up the overall classification too prominently yet, but Team CSC, I think, with that performance here, proved that they are a team built around Ivan Basso. They get the win there by a single second ahead of T-Mobile and Discovery Channel, Phil, losing almost 39 seconds. Well, there he is shaking the champers, and I must say that one-second margin will be a huge boost here for Team CSC because morally... They've got the victory in the time trial, or they haven't got the pink jersey. That will certainly go across to Sergei Honshaw. Six seconds better than Jens Voigt of CSC. It was close. Michael Rogers up into third place now, the world time trial champion. There he is. He gets the pink jersey, and as I say, he's worn it before. He's worn it before, and he is looking very happy with that. And he will be a difficult man, I think, Phil, over the next couple of days to dislodge. <laughs> And it's back to the sprinters in today's stage of the Giro d'Italia at the end of the opening week, which has included the big transfer down from Belgium, and it's a ride of well in excess of 200 kilometres. Fairly flat course, and it's a kind of course that really should suit the sprinters. And just out of interest, the finishing town of Forli just happens to be the hometown of the great Italian sprinter of yore, Ercole Baldini. Yes, and Baldini, Gimola. very, very famous indeed. And now we're looking down at the race here. We've come joined the action about three kilometres from the finish. The peloton pretty much all together here, and it's going to be the sprinters once more, and I'm sure the eyes are going to be on the whereabouts of McEwen now, although Olaf Pollock is showing us he can sprint very well at the moment. But again, we're seeing Team Milram at the front, and it's not quite apparent as to why they're doing all this pacemaking. Well, I really can't understand why they're doing all the pacemaking on the front unless, of course, they think somebody like uh, Alberto Ongarato, who's very often a big lead-out man for Alessandro Pataki, has got a chance. There's Robbie McEwen, number 75, in the Ciclamina jersey. Right on his wheel there was Paolo Bettini. Bettini will be battling to try and get that jersey if he can because he knows that Robbie McEwen probably won't see Milano in a race like this. That's true. Uh, again, McEwen says he won't see the finish. He'll probably last 10 days and then head home back into Belgium to prepare for the 
the Tour de France, which has been his routine these last couple of years, and I must say it's given him a very successful time in the Tour de France. Uh, Rigotto, the youngster on this team, is also another man who is looking for the lead out from Milram. It's a chance now for Milram to experiment, I suppose, uh, because they've lost their big sprinter. Just look at the heart rate here to Fabio Sacchi. He's on the same team as Milram as well. Uh, maximum there of 195. He's pushing up to 88%. Well, Rabobank right up there as well, and that could well be Graham Brown who's been brought in to Rabobank as the team sprinter here, and he may well be a man trying to mix it. He was very successful a couple of years ago in the Giro d'Italia when he was riding for the Panaria squad. It's the kind of sprint that a man like Graham Brown would enjoy. In fact, you can see, Phil, the main field is split up quite a bit there, and I wonder if out on the course there has actually been an accident. Uh, well, there's your answer, Paul, because this is further down the course, and in fact there has been a shunt here, and it's involved the riders from T-Mobile, which is a shame. 213 has just come up. Uh, that was Kessler again near the back. Here's the battle at the front. They will get the same time because they're inside three kilometres from the finish, and the accident means same time as the group, but nonetheless, this is a tricky finish here. Milram are doing all of the work here, and somewhere in there, and if we don't see him very often, will be McEwen. Well, you never see me. And there's another crash. Oh, yep. This is again in the last three kilometres. There's a lot of danger, a lot of risks taken in these finishes. You can see Milram on the front trying to look back down their line there. Robin McCune is in fourth. Fifth place is Paolo Bettini. There behind Paolo Bettini is Olaf Polak. Well, again, Milram has swung off the front here, just left one ride as a lead out, what looks like Thomas Vakers of AG2R on his back wheel. Well, that's another huge mistake here. Now, you see, without a, a definite sprint leader's team, they don't know what to do here. They're looking for someone else to make the move. Now they're digging very, very deeply, and in the centre of the picture, in the Chiclamina points jersey, McEwen is coming away again. Maximum points in the points competition, and win number three. That's unbelievable. I've never seen him sprint so well. Well, Robbie so far has gone superbly. Two stage wins in Belgium, one in Italy, stages two, four and six. That heads up for a very good future for this man in the Giro d'Italia. I wonder how many days he's going to stay there. Look at this acceleration, the huge kick there. That's Thomas Vakers there, by the way, a very good track sprinter going right up through the middle. But then all of a sudden, Robbie McEwen sees the chance of the win here. And Robbie, this season, Phil, just seems to have that little bit of extra power as he goes by there. Not a problem at all. Vakers started a little early on, but Polak comes back quite quickly just to fade on Robbie McEwen's wheel for second place. And, of course, a very interesting time bonus. Yes, uh, McEwen himself doing well there, but what about Olaf Polak? Because he keeps getting up there and he's always getting uh, beaten by McEwen. He must be pretty fed up with that now. Vakers made his run too soon. McEwen, I don't know where he gets that strength from. He's such a small guy, yet he, uh, he's a complete powerhouse. Fantastic sprint finish by McEwen. He's gone in ahead of Polak and Vaitkus. And the confidence boy, somebody I've never seen race before, Leonardo Duke, is the man who's got fourth there for France and uh, on the Cofferdis team. Fernandez Uscatel, about time they had a sprinter on their team. He's in fifth. And Guidi and Bettini, the Italians, in sixth and seventh. Well, McEwen is the man opening the champagne at the moment. And uh, the consistency of Polak and the small bonuses, Paul. I haven't worked it out, but he could be the next man in the pink jersey here. We'll wait for the result. Well, his team was right up there in the team time trial, which pushed him high up in the overall classification. And I think he's got a very good chance of creating the surprise. Two seconds, in fact, ahead of his own teammate, Sergei Gonchar and Jens Voigt up there in third place. And uh, there's been a lot of debate about Gonchar's name recently, whether it's Gonchar or Honchar. He himself actually calls himself Gonchar, and he would like us all to accept that. I think it's the way you pronounce the G in his language. It sounds like an H. But there we are, there. Pollock has got some deserves out of his good sprinting this week, and uh, the result is Amalia Rosa. So Sergei Gonchar, who has won five time trial stages in the Giro d'Italia, that's all he's won is the time trial stages, had just that one day in pink. So the race continues on the eastern side of Italy as we go down the leg here. Massive stage of over 230 kilometres. Well, a very testing day for most of the riders now. The first little test of a one or two difficult climbs, and we'll get a chance to see whether or not today the sprinters will survive. That climb in the middle, the Monte Cittara, is a very difficult climb. And, of course, as always in the Giro d'Italia, there's a couple of nasty little climbs down towards the finish. Well, the undulations have projected uh, one man here riding extremely well today. And this, uh, this is a Staff Shearlinks. He's a Cofferdish rider now. 
as he comes up here towards the top of the first climb of the day. This is uh, the Monte Catria. He was also the leader over San Marino, which is at 42 kilometres. We're at 137 kilometres here. Shearling's getting maximum points and heading towards the King of the Mountains jersey. Well, he's a young rider on the Cofidis squad who's not very highly rated in Belgium, but they decided to give him a chance on Team Cofidis, and I think today he's actually paying them back for that. It looked as if uh, Rick Verbrugge was in a group just behind, but you can see the chase is certainly on, and a very complicated course. As we look on the right-hand side, uh, that's a rather complicated graphic as well. <laughs> this looks rather upsetting, that graphic. We've moved on here now to the next climb, which is the Montadeli Cesani taking us through to just under 200 kilometres. Magnificent scenery now on the Giro d'Italia. We're on that climb now, and Discovery Channel trying to get a hand in the furs here as well. This is the main field. They're still running at around about a minute, minute and a half, I think, uh, behind the breakaway, which has changed. Verbrugge is up there now, along with uh, Francisco Villa and Juan Manuel Garate. It's tricky Beltran on the front there with Padronos and Matty White in attendance as well, riding uh, once again this season for Team Discovery Channel. But this is uh, the remnants of the breakaway out on the course, and that's the best way to enjoy the Giro. Absolutely. Enjoy the sunshine here as we head uh, into early summer. This is the... Uh leading group here at one kilometre from the summit. Garate just going through there in the Spanish National Champions jersey. Rick Verbrugge just tagging on the back here. A winner, of course, of the fastest ever prologue in the Giro d'Italia a couple of years ago, and that was around about 58 kilometres an hour. Now, that's a dangerous move for a man to get in the break as well. That's Matthias Kessler there in the pink jersey of T-Mobile, wearing number 213. I must say that Kessler there, who's been dangling at the back of his team, suddenly got himself into a move here for Brugger doing nothing here won't try to endanger now what is a, a looking like a king of the mountains lead for Shearlings, his teammate down at the finish there's Kessler again the big guns, uh, the men we expect to project themselves once the mountains come are keeping out of the thick of the action here but it looks as though a lot of the work now is being left to the Discovery Channel team to try and get this race back together well, you have to think about the possibility of a late attack by, of course, their man, Paolo Savardelli. It's a very tricky descent down into the run in, uh, at the finish line, and that may well be the plan. But if they want to try and get a win for Paolo Savardelli, first of all, Phil, they've actually got, got to catch this breakaway. Well, as the race heads down towards the finish, the gap is still significant here, and a lot of work is still to be done. And Verbrugge has done none of this work. He's just sat at the back of this group, clearly a man with a plan. Well, he's in a good situation. He doesn't have to contribute at all as we come up to the next King of the Mountains point, and his man, Staff Shearlink, is getting all of the points today and amassing a lot of points on an early stage of the Giro like this can lay the foundations for a victory in that competition. We've seen that happen so many times in the past. And the crowd have come out here. Still a little bit of snow lying up on the mountains there. A very interesting descent this now on the Monte della Cisani. 196 kilometres covered. That's Garate leading them down at the front there in the jersey of national champion. Just tagged on the back. In fact, um, I was just looking to see where Verbrugge was. Uh, Verbrugge, I think, has moved up into about second position there, keeping a very close attention, I think, on the points. No, he's just, on the front. Uh, yes, he's come past to get points he's there. He's on the front. So that'll give him second place. So Verbrugge over the top and Garate right behind him. Wearing the colours of the Spanish champion there. Oh, this is a bit of a problem. The uh, overnight leader there, Polak, in a group of riders being dropped on this climb, and that's not surprising, Phil. This is the first big test that the sprinters have had, and for them, it's going to be a long day to just make sure they get to the finish of this stage. And it's not just the mountains today, it's undulations, really, but it's also an extremely long stage, this, over 236 kilometres. There's a little bit of work having to be done now by Team CSC because they've got nobody up there. They might be a bit worried about the whereabouts of a brugger and Savadelli up there as well. 46 seconds, the gap. They're having some effect here on this climb now. Significantly, this is the last real climb before they head down towards the finish. The gap is closing. A little bit of picture breakup, and that's because we are going through a fairly forested area here, and that breaks up the microwave link from the motorbikes that are following these riders up to the helicopter and uh, down to the finish line. But we're moving along through the very heart of Italy as we head down towards the southern tip of the peninsula. And, of course, Team CSC today starting to show why they believe that they've got the winner in their ranks, of course, and they believe, and the whole of this squad, Phil, is dedicated to Ivan Basso. They believe and they've come to this race to try and win it. 
Well, they've done well. They've closed that gap down. We're on the way down. The clock is still counting. But uh, once we're over the top, I reckon it was about a minute, minute ten uh, when they came over the top of the climb. CSC now heading the charge down, try and close it down a little bit more. It's a long, tortuous descent, but on very good roads here. These aren't the high mountains, of course, here in Italy. They're still to come, the Italian Alps and the Dolomites. Well, there's an arm going up there. It looks as if somebody's got a mechanical problem. It looked like a pink jersey of T-Mobile going to the back looking for the team car. And I think somebody has got a mechanical. There's T-Mobile coming up alongside. It could be on the descent here that a rider is just looking to take on board a drink. You're only allowed to take on board drinks uh, after 50 kilometres of the race has been covered and up until 20 kilometres to go. But you're not allowed to take on board drinks on a climb just in case somebody tries a little professional foul. Well, these riders trying as best they can, at least the leaders of the projected leaders of the race are trying to get a rest out of this stage today because tomorrow is the first mountain top finish. And uh, that's when uh, we should see some indication as to who is looking for the final classification. Yep, 40 kilometres to go. Oh, and in fact, I was wrong, Paul, because the clock could have gone through there and I reckon the time must have been at 40 kilometres. 2.36 is what they're saying. So they've still got to put a little bit of distance to right here. Yep, I think that's why now Team CSC are starting to take this a little bit more seriously. Moving up there as well, you can see one of the riders from Lamprey, that's uh, Marzio Brusegin, one of those uh, interesting riders who seems to have been around for almost forever, and I don't think Phil he's ever actually had a professional victory. Yes, he's a, a very consistent strong man though, whichever way you look at it. They're coming up towards the summit here. So this will be the top of the last climb of the day, so it's still quite a significant gap. And the clock is still ticking. Yeah, it's on the finish line then. So, Team CSC moving forward, there's three or four riders, there's Jens Voigt over to the right-hand side. Even though Jens Voigt is up high in the overall classification, he, uh, alongside uh, Bobby Julik, I think, will be d dedicating themselves to the chase for the team, because tomorrow a guy like Ivan Basso has to come out and prove to the team that he's the top dog. Well, I must say, this is a, a beautiful course today. Great roads, good fast tempo climbing. There's the top of the mountains, no points available here. The breakaway has gone through. Sandy Kassar, who's led the King of the Mountains for three days, is now out of that leader's jersey. That's going to switch across to Steph Shearlinks. Back with Verbrugge here now at the front of the race. And setting the pace with him there is uh, Stangelai. Just in the Lamprey jersey as well is... Uh... Franco Vila, Francisco Villa. Yeah, Garate. Villa had a very good start to the season and in fact uh, won a stage of Paris Nice. You can see here now this group is starting to look rather serious. There's Garate going through in the yellow and red jersey. And you can see now a different team coming to the front in the main field. In fact, Team Lamprey are also probably thinking about uh, their man who's got a good chance of doing well here, Damiano Cunigo. Yes, they're starting to really turn the screws there. The uh, Sonia Prudier rider in that breakaway, by the way, is Manuela Mori. There he is, uh, just off to the left here. But this is a, this is um, this is Riano at the back, and that's a bit of a surprise. He's come to this race. Let's not forget he finished protest. fourth overall <laughs> last year. Yes, certainly, very strange situation because contractually, basically at the end of the Giro d'Italia, he will switch teams and become a member of Quickstep. Ten kilometres to go, and the back being put into it now. As this breakaway beginning to sense, they may have pulled off a bit of a coup here. The gap is closing, but is it going to close quick enough? On the front, you can see the acceleration now, and it looks there's Kunigo. Yeah, he's, he's relying on Bouchagin to do all the work for him. Well, he's looking for the win. Look at the size of that group, though. There are not very many riders left in this group. There's riders going off the back there for Credi Agricole, and that's all because of the pressure of riders like Brusegin, a very tough bike rider. Many times he's finished way up in the individual time trials at the Giro d'Italia, but he's a man that is really well respected on the team because of the amount of work that he can put in. They're about to start the descent, which I have to tell you, Phil, is rather tricky. And you're right about Bruchardine, he's never won a bike race and he turned pro back in 1997, but he is such a great workhorse, every team wants to have him on the squad. Well, we've seen his name on the leaderboard many times and in fact I remember one time in an individual time trial in the Giro, he led from very early on and it was only when one of the last riders came in that he was dethroned and dropped down into second place. One day though, I'm sure he'll get himself a big win. And one thing is for sure now that a former winner of this race, uh, Damiano Cunigo, has ideas on this year's event because he's right there. He's told his team to close down this breakaway as best they can. 
That's Mori at the back here. There's the full list of the breakaway for you. And it's Pena who's also in here as well. He's on Team Phonak, by the way, now. Switch teams from Discovery Channel. Well, Kunigo, the man you're talking about, is fighting himself back to the top of the sport. Had a very difficult season last year, trying to get over mononucleosis or glandular fever. And uh, it seems this year that he might well have just got back to the form that he had a couple of years ago when he actually won the Giro d'Italia. And, of course, he did win the Giro del Trentino, which the Italians always think is an indicator to good form for the Giro. Well, there's a little look at the route they've covered now. We're over all of the hills now, heading down towards the finish, but that little rise before the finish could be crucial here. It's just a small climb, not classified, but enough to break up this leading group. 53 seconds of the Grupo Testa, the leading group, so they are shutting it down, and basically it's all down to the work here of Lamprey, and they are heading this charge down into town now, and they're not looking for any help whatsoever. So they're trying to put Cunigo back into this. They certainly are trying to pull him in. This is the kind of stage he would try and get himself a victory. We'll have a look here at Franco Pellizzotti, rides for Credi Agricole, has a maximum heart rate ability of 190, and currently he's riding at 151 beats a minute, so he's right up there, and the speed at the moment, 70 kilometres an hour. Sign of a fit man there, only running at 79%, considering the pressure on that. That's the full Lamprey squad are up there just now, and it looks like most of the peloton are here. They've had a hard ride. This is Juan Manuel Garate, champion of Spain. Looking good, riding for a quick step. Got himself a different colour helmet to the rest of the guys just to make that kit look nice and uniform. Franco Villa there, 119, going through doing his turn. He's not going to do too much because he will know behind it's his team that doing the most of the pace making to try and pull this all back together. Verbrugge there now goes through for his turn. As you can get a chance to see here, quite a tricky little descent. Verbrugge taken over the lead role here from Steph Schierling because Schierling's dropped back, uh, having done enough to take the lead in the King of the Mountains. Verbrugge now is representing Kofidis here. And it looks as though he's decided now, he's sensing there's a chance because at 48 seconds the gap, they need everybody to the helm at the front because the gap is coming down but the finish is getting close. And that's a very select bunch that's chasing, it wasn't the pack at all. Well, it's going to be very close indeed and the main field really needs to keep the pressure on as we get closer to the finish. Testa de la Corsa, front end of the bike race. Juan Manuel Garati's got the great chance of pulling off a coup here because he's a very, got a very good fast turn of speed when it comes to the end of a stage like this. But you see all of the Lamprey riders in this group feel right on the front end. And coming round that corner, I make it around about 40 seconds. There's going to be some serious time gains here by this chase group as we're now looking here at the Grace coming in. There's Pavel Savadelli just there at the front. He's wearing the blue jersey there, by the way. Not his Discovery Channel jersey, but in fact the blue jersey as leader of the Combine classification, a rider who is best placed in all of the individual classifications in the race. Now then we're looking here and I think that was five kilometers to go <laughs> one of the uh, Sony Duval riders they're not too interested in doing the work slipping back into the pack this is uh, Jan Ulrich here now I think he's at the tail of this group he's just got into uh, we need to swing around uh, I'm not sure making a move the has gone now he sat at the back an awful long way he sensed the group was coming back he started to work with them and this is the master of the time trial and there's no reaction from those chasers well they need to be right on this man's wheel if they want to make sure they stay with him to the finish because he is a very good individual time trialist but I've seen him make moves like this in races like the Tour de France I remember a couple of years ago it was in the eastern part of France where he got caught inside the last 300 metres five kilometres to go to the main field and in fact I think it's stretched out a fraction there this this is a replay now of Rebrugger's move, perfectly <laughs> executed. Everybody else was on the right-hand side of the road, and when he accelerated, the guys were obviously suffering and looked the other way and said, well, have a go yourself, mate. Well, Francisco Villa there was perfectly poised to have gone with Verbrugger, clearly never had the legs to go with him. The last time Rick Verbrugger won a race, it was the prologue time trial, much shorter than today's race, and that was last August in the Benelux Tour, which is that new tour that runs between uh, Belgium, the Holland and Luxembourg. And now he's got clear. Now, once he settles in, if they don't organise themselves, they won't get back on turns with this top time trial rider. Rick Verbrugger flying the flag. He's not a big winner these days, but he's, 
if he can just get this. He's won a couple of stages before of the Giro d'Italia. There's Kunigo, just at the back of the line of Lamprey riders. The lime green jersey just behind him is Danilo De Luca, who could also be looking for a win on a stage like this. And not far away from the front was Carlos Sastra from Team CSC, but he will be looking after Ivan Basso. Basso not looking for a win here this afternoon, but just making sure that he's at the front of this group and, of course, not getting himself into any danger. This is Vic Rebuga now in the streets of the finishing town. Great position, good time trialling position, still looking very solid, not rocking the top part of his body very much at all. He will be looking up the road every now and again, Phil, just dreaming and hoping that he can see the red flag with 1,000 metres to go. Just trying to look back there, I think the group were around about 10 or 15 seconds behind him, and it's still around about 40 seconds to the main field. Here's big Axel Merckx as well. Well, Verbrugge, I think, has read this to perfection. Seven seconds, and look at this. That group is only 43 seconds back of the chase group now. And, you know, I haven't caught any sighting of the pink jersey. I'd almost forgotten about him, to be honest. And it looks as though uh, Schumacher is in trouble here and he's dropping away. So, not Schumacher, Pollock, who got the jersey as the sprinter. So, today's Tommy Danielson. Been hard. Tommy Danielson having a go here. And that was a nice move by Tommy Danielson. I think all of the sprinters have pretty much called it a day off this afternoon. They've had most of their glory. This course, much too heavy and undulating for riders like Polak and Robbie McEwen. Today, it's a different kind of rider. The men who are looking at winning this race overall after three weeks of racing. And, of course, the men who are adventurists like this man, Rick Verbrugge, there has got about seven or ten seconds over a small chasing group of riders who he was with and still around about 43 seconds, so it's doable. But it's a tough run into town, although on the profile, Phil, it shows that it goes downhill towards the finish. There's this nasty little kick-up inside the last three Ks. Well, this will be a big result for the French team rider here, although he's Belgian. Cofferty's uh, head office isn't far from the borders of Belgium, and that's why they take Belgian riders on the squad, I guess. This is the group he's left, and there's no way they're chasing now. They're hoping to survive. There's a big danger they're not going to survive here. Uh, Verbrugge might have read this absolutely right because I think they could sweep up those four chases on the running. They were looking a bit frisky. Here they are, still Lamprey, trying to dra drag Damiano Cunigo back into this. This is the first selection, I think, of this year's Giro d'Italia. Basso is in this group as well, so too is Paolo Savadelli. So the men that matter are here, the sprinters are out of it on the day and there will be a new leader tonight too. Well, what could be good here really for Rick Verbrugge is once this group catches that group of riders in between the gap there, there'll be a little bit of confusion. They won't know exactly how the race is developing. They might slow down a fraction and that could give Rick Verbrugge the chance to survive. Here's Tommy Danielson. This has got to be his coming of age this season. There's Paolo Salvadelli moving up alongside him. I think Tommy D there, wearing number two, will look after Paolo Salvadelli in the Giro d'Italia because they say that the access of his season is going to be the Vuelta a España at the end of the year. Oh, well, it's hurting him now. He's on the slight drag now up towards the finishing line. Still a little way to go. And there's the attack from uh, uh, Mori is having a go. He's trying to get away. I think they sense now this is almost over, this breakaway. We could just pull back. That's Manuela Mori, who's gone clear, but they're after him. I don't think they're going to allow this one to go. They, that, but they've missed the race. This rider's going to win, all being well. A little climb up to the finish for him now. Well, 1.4 kilometres to go for Rick Verbrugge as he goes around this corner. It's supposed to be a slightly downhill finish, but it is not. You've always got to read the race handbook every night when you come into a stage race like this, but sometimes the race referees and the race organisers tend to get the profiles a little bit wrong, and that can be the undoing of a very good rider. This is now, I think, the front end of the group, still led by Lamprey. They're thinking about, Phil, the victory for Damiano Cunego. He would like a win on a stage like this, but that group, I make it down to just about 30 riders only. Yes, and that's Paolo Tirolongo, in fact, for Lamprey, who's trying to set the pace here. Now, once he's up here, this is where it will level out. He's getting over the rise up into the town. So many Italian towns are built on top of mountains, and uh, that's what they'll feel like right now because this has been a desperate move by Rick Verbrugge, but that's how you win stages, and this is going to go down as a great win by him. As he rides clear, they're not going to bring him back now. He's still looking like a very strong man here. Well, he's not weakening. He's still got good pedalling fluidity. The legs ticking over there. Just rocking the top part of his body, but that's to find a little bit of energy now. He'll be looking at those blue and white banners at the side of the road, reading every one of them. 700 metres to go. He'll cast a look back over his shoulder. He's been in the saddle for six hours and 40 minutes here this afternoon. And for Verbrugge, every time he goes round one of these corners, he'll be looking to see whether or not he can see the finish 
finishing banner because only then will he ease up on his effort. I'll tell you what, for some of the riders at the back, they're going to be out for more than seven hours today. Oh, it's hurting now, Phil. Look at this. Now it's starting to kick in. This is a nasty little finish. I'll tell you what, most of the riders will not have expected this. Well, amongst the riders we are hearing is abandoned. The sprinter Graham Brown has gone today, so he hasn't got very far around Italy after completing the early days through Belgium. And tomorrow is the first real mountain top finish of this tour. And Rick Verbrugger, well, he was not going to pull back the time required to pull on the Malia Rosa, but somebody in that league group is, and we don't have the full composition. Final efforts now from Rick Verbrugger as he heads up to the line, and I think the others behind are virtually on the tail of the chasers. And we've got no pictures of that to show you. Oh, there they are. That's still Vila, Garate. They're still surviving, but last time we looked back, I could see the shadow of the main field not very far behind them. That's Victor Hugo Peña there for there Team Conrad. There's the front, and it looks as if it's a rider from Discovery Channel coming out of the pack. Well, it's got the style of Paolo Savadelli, that young man. He's uh, crouched over the top of the bikes, but Rick Verbrugger won't care. 250 metres to go. We're going to get the victory here. Big win for Cofidis. It's been the Cofidis day out, really, because Shearlink has got himself the lead in the King of the Mountains. Savadelli has found the legs and caught the on the climb but Brugger was wise to break away because the leaders have been wiped out in sight of the finish another classic chase by the big peloton well Rick Verbrugger 150 metres to go he's getting out of the saddle he's still got the neutral service car behind him so he'll still feel that he's got the chance of this victory but he's got to keep the pressure on because this Phil Hill Phil to me seems interminable uh, I don't know where the downhill bit was it's climbing right to the line this one as Verbrugger wisely looks over his shoulder, he knows the proximity, it won't matter now. The last 10 metres are going to feel pretty good as he comes up to the line. So Rick Verbrugger of Belgium gives the French team a victory. Today in the Giro d'Italia, it won't be good enough for the race lead. Because look how close Salvadelli oh, is. He's amazing. right in the same finishing straight as Salvadelli is the man who's created the big surprise. I think he's looking here, Phil, for one of the time bonuses. And he's going to get it because he takes second place right on the line here. That was an inspiring finished by Paolo Savadelli as they all come up to the line here it looks as though Sergei Gonshaw was in pink there he was right up at the front in about the top 10 or 15 places now he could be the man to be the new overall leader here this afternoon and of course Tommy Danielson was in the group as well there is Danilo De Luca 131 I think he's actually probably going to lose a little bit of time there because there are time finishing gaps here on the line well, we'll find out in a few minutes. The clock continues to count now. There's Danilo De Luca. He may have cost him a few seconds uh, as he looks around there. He doesn't look too happy with whatever has happened anyway, but uh, I think that was Gonchar. And uh, there he is, finishing in seventh place. He must have done enough to reclaim the pink jersey here. Basso also watching every move in sixth place now. And all of the favourites that we think are the favourites have finished in that group. So the first strength has been shown by the big men. And Rick Verbrugger, using his head, chose exactly the right moment to leave that league group. He did sit behind for a long time. He made the most of it. And Honchar gets it five seconds only ahead of Paolo Savadelli, last year's champion looking good. Ivan Basso also up there now in third place. And Michael Rogers there. Watch out for Tommy Danielson too, because he's now up into seventh. Back in pink for Sir Guy Honshaw. Boy, I bet he never expected that. Having taken the lead away from the sprinter Olaf Pollock. It's taken 1,100 kilometres, but now they're going to find the real climbs, or climb in this case, on this stage today, because that is the finish at the Paso Lanciano. It'll take the riders 1,300 metres up, and it's 12 kilometres to climb. Well, that's what this stage is all about, moving away from Civitanova Marche, flat part of the course all the way to the bottom of the final climb of the day, 12 kilometres the ascent. It's going to be a showdown. And not surprisingly, it is on the climb that we join the action here because that is what the riders have been waiting for. There's the composition of the leaders. Danilo De Luca is here. Cunigo is in this group. Ivan Basso is here. Well, that was Danilo De Luca just hanging on to the back of the group. Ivan Basso just sitting on the tail of his teammate. I think that was Carlos Sastra. This is Paolo Salvadelli looking very good in his combine jersey. He's held that jersey, in fact, since the very first day of this race. 
Well, he may be well, looking good, Paul, well, no. but I'm not sure where he is. I think he's in trouble here. Well, in fact, he hasn't been able to stick on the wheel. He looked fairly comfortable. You know, he's not one of the great climbers, and especially today, this is the first big climb, the first big test of all of the riders in the Giro. This, this is, is the former winner of the King of the Mountains. It's funny how the first series climbs can catch out well-known names. Now, uh, Salvadelli's in trouble, uh, wasn't expected, and certainly uh, Perez wasn't expected to be in trouble. Well, the big problem is, for about a week, these riders have been using very big gears on the flat stage, and then all of a sudden it's a completely different pedalling action. You've got to use small gears, turn at a high cadence, and that seems to be the problem here with Paolo Salvadelli. He's trying to pull himself back into this race if he can, and he has to do something special here this afternoon. Defending champion, the winner last year, but let's not forget, even on his way to the win last year, even with two days to go, Phil, he was put into difficulty in the mountain passes of the Dolomites. Well, this is the first real chance for the top climbers to get the tempo going. Danilo De Luca, we don't really count him as a climber, but he can get over the climbs, and uh, he's also in trouble anyway here now. Danilo De Luca trying to do a performance for Leaky Gas, but he's hanging on the back here now. Looks like Gutierrez is the big man in there as well for Team Fonak. But all of the work on the front there being done by Carlos Sastra. Look how steep this climb is. A very nasty climb. De Luca is surviving, Phil. He might be under a bit of pressure, but he is staying in contact with the big men of the Giro this year. That was Gutierrez as well from Team Fonak, but gone. You may have noticed, Sergei Gonchar, he slipped off the back on the very low slopes of this climb. So the pink jersey looking set to change hands, and Basso, remember yesterday, climbed up to the podium positions. He's now in a position to take over pink with this performance, and he's looking extremely strong here, consistent as he looks now for a move, perhaps. You see who's on his wheel, though. The yellow jersey of Sonia Duval, Gilberto Simoni. He, too, will be looking to try and get himself the win, a specialist for mountaintop finishes. Cunigo up there also for Team Lamprey. The big heads of Stateville have come out to play very early on, and they're trying to make this quite decisive. Well, Sastra, the ever-faithful teammate of Basso, we've seen it in the Tour de France as well, now setting the pace up here unselfishly. And uh, doesn't look at all under pressure here, Ivan Basso. It's a bit of a long climb, this one. 12 kilometres, 7 miles. Good tempo riding. A little earpiece there indicating that Basso will know exactly what sort of pain he's causing people like Savadelli, who's now been uncoupled at the back. The other yellow jersey there is Leonardo Pipoli, the little climber, the Italian rider who spent the majority of his career riding for Spanish teams. And now he'll be a big asset for Gilberto Simone just a little bit later on. Five kilometres to go there. Actually, Paul, I've just seen at the back, I think that is Sergei Gonchar just still sitting at the back of that group. I need another shot. Well, that's quite it possible. Like him. It's quite possible. He has ridden high in the overall standings in the Giro before. He's a strong oh, yeah. rider in the Giro d'Italia. This is Simone. He'll be thinking about laying the foundations. That is Kunigo. Looking very cool. I think riding himself back in 11th overall at the start of the day, 121 behind. He's a young rider. This man, I think, is definitely a star of the future. Just looking to see... Oh, no, no, no. It's, no. Uh, it's actually Julio Perez has got back. It was the colours on our monitor looked a bit more pink than they, no, they were, in fact. I think... Uh, I haven't actually seen the pink jersey. No, he's Malia gone. He went to the bottom of the climb. I think it's a little bit too tough for him, and I think he and the team there, Danilo De Luca now suffering a fraction too. That's Ruiano in the blue and white jersey there, the little climber from Venezuela who last year was the king of the mountains and finished in fourth place overall. I'll tell you what, this is a magnificent piece of pacemaking here by Sastra, unselfishly so. That was group number two there. In fact, Tommy Danielson was in the second group on the road, so he's... Uh, not managed to catch the good train here this afternoon. Sastra doing an awful lot of work there, 192. All he's thinking about is laying down foundations for his man. And in fact, he seems to have got his own teammate into a spot of bother too, because Basso having to climb out of the saddle. Simone looking pretty cool there. Ruggiano just sitting there behind, former winner of the Tour de Lancarbe. Danilo De Luca, yeah, he's gone. Still concentrating, just limiting his losses as best he can, but there's still a little way to go up this climb. The losses could be significant by the time we get to the top. Well, the important thing, if you lose the wheel in front of you in a group like this in the big mountain passes, you've just got to try and uh, recover. This is a little bit further down there. You can see this is Tommy Danielson. He is pacing his teammate there, Paolo Salvadelli. Just moving forward, this looks like Emmanuel Seller going up there, a rider who in the last couple of years has been a, a great revelation. But Salvadelli certainly not enjoying this first taste of the mountains, Phil, really all over his machine. 
Yes, uh, Seller here, he, number 41. He cut his teeth on the tour of Italy a couple of years ago when he won that big stage in the mountains on his own. But now he's finding he's a marked man. It's not so easy. Uh, De Luca just trying to hold them, but look at that gap. It's opened very, very quickly. And it's all down to the tempo riding of uh, Carlos Sastra. Is this Rucciano in trouble think, as I well? Think he's coming off the back as well. Psychologically, oh, he's not. He's going off, going the, off front. the front. Well, that's the sign of a, a South American climber, if you like, because these riders from South America, they have the ability to go very quickly uphill. And he would look to me a few moments ago as if he was under real pain and now all of a sudden he's attacked this is Gilberto Simone on the left look at the pressure appearing on his face as opposed to the calm and collected manner of the man on the right, Ivan Basso well, in a couple of weeks time uh, Jose Rujano will be part of the quick step team but right now he's been forced more or less to come out from home and ride this, his last race for the Sella Italia they're part of the organisation, they're part of the sponsorship of this race and they, he was told he should come and ride but his, his brain isn't into gear yet he may be getting himself a little bit of confidence here. Well, We've got three, six, eight riders now and they're got, holding him. He hasn't got that much of a gap, Phil, and not definitely not the climbing ability that he showed last year when he came to the Giro d'Italia because nobody could hold him at all in the big mountain passes. Sastra, you see on the front there, is not panicked at all. He's just kept the tempo nice and steady. He's just looking at that rider in front, and I think he has the measure of him. In fact, he can probably pull him back at any stage that he wants to, but they're not playing the stage here this afternoon. Most of the riders in that group that we're looking at there are thinking long-term. They're thinking about three weeks. They're not thinking about today. They're thinking about trying to lay the foundations for a race victory. Absolutely. This is the first big selection. This race really started yesterday. Uh, when Ivan Basso and the big boys got up into the overall classification, Cunigo as well. And now this is the big play on the mountaintop, just to see who is strong. And this race will finish when the mountain finishes, and it's as simple as that. Danilo De Luca isn't falling that far behind. He's trying to keep his own pace now. That's the thing on a climb like this. You can't ride to the speed of others. You ride to your own speed, although it looks from the camera shot he might be climbing back into this. Well, De Luca has banked, I think, Phil, his whole season on the Giro d'Italia this year. Last year, let's not forget, he was the winner of the first and inaugural Pro Tour and uh, I think this year he came back and decided to change his preparation slightly to try and be on form because he, he nurtured, I think, ideas last year of the possibility of winning this race. And you're right, you mustn't panic in a situation like this. Look how Sastra there in first position on the group didn't panic at all and he's just carefully and slowly reeled back in Ruyano. But look yeah. at that, Simone now can't stay there. Well, there's a move by Cunego. Well, that's the move they should be looking at. Cunego is gone. He's left himself still a considerable way to ride at this mountain. I might have kept it a bit longer but he's decided to go and just to see what's in those legs now any reaction well the man reacting is Ivan Basso look how Sastra has popped he's just gone over to the right hand side said I've done the work now guys I can't do any more it's up to the leader this is the moment you prove you're a leader of the team that's the moment when you have to assume control but this is a very explosive acceleration by Damiano Cunego the man who I think this year is on his way back to the top well he's I have to say that Basso looked extremely calm when he went across that gap and he still looks good Simone is the man who may have missed out here well he's actually having to ask Pipoli there to work with him. Pipoli, the little climber from, from Italy, riding on the Spanish Sonia Duval team, has come to the front to try and pace him. Ivan Basso now has seen that the other challengers in the Giro d'Italia this afternoon are in a spot of bother, so he's gone to the front to assume control. And I tell you what, he's just opened up a length lead there over Cunego, and this is Jose Enrique Gutierrez for Fonac. He's hanging on there for third place on the road. So Ivan Basso has started now to lift the tempo and I don't think Cunigo has recovered from the acceleration he made it was quickly answered by Basso and now Cunigo desperate here at the moment there is a reaction Gutierrez I think it is who's trying to come up for the Fonac squad behind but Basso is now deciding what Cunigo starts he might be able to finish well it was a big acceleration that came from Kunigo. Look at the face now here of Ivan Basso, concentrated. He hasn't got big gaps for the moment, though, Phil, but this is a psychological blow, looking over his shoulder to see what sort of a gap he's got. Kunigo is second, Gutierrez is third, but the man who will want to distance this afternoon, if he can, of course, is Gilberto Simone, the former two-time winner of this race. 
Well, they're saying it's Savadelli there. No, sorry, that Savadelli's in that group at 115. There's plenty of riders in between. There's a scene of the finishing line. It's a bit chilly on the top, too, as they start to climb up. Let's not forget that Basso has said he wants to win both the Tour de France and the Giro d'Italia this year. Nobody's done that since Marco Pantani uh, back in 1998. I think he's a bit foolish to announce such a thing, in all honesty, but here we go. Well, he's pushing for the leadership of this one anyway. Well, one thing he promised to his mother when she passed away was that he was going to win the Giro d'Italia, and that, I think, is one reason why he's come here. I'm not sure in this day and age it's possible to win the two major tours in the one year, but for him it's a tall order. But I think it's to, to keep that promise that he made, that he's come here to try and win the Giro, and then he's got to try and get himself back into form if he wants to win the Tour de France as well. There is Gilberto Simoni being nervous. First up the court, the climb here, he too feel one of the strange riders who's having a very difficult day on this first mountain pass. Well, De Luca also keeping himself in with a chance here in a high overall position by the end of this day. Now, Basso, it's not the time to think what happened to him last year because he got the Maglia Rosa last year, then he had a dreadful day, lost 45 minutes, went plummeting down the overall but never gave up and in fact came back with two back-to-back -back stage wins and uh, then left the tour finally uh, feeling a lot better than when he started it midway through at least. Well, I took my hat off to him last year because when you are a great challenger looking at winning a race like the Giro d'Italia and you use for lose 45 minutes in one day, I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd abandoned on that occasion, but he showed his mettle there and carried on, finished the race in the Gruppetto and bounced back a couple of days later with a win. And went on, of course, to finish up behind Lance Armstrong in the Tour de France so at the end of the day he did salvage more than something from it but today he's looking extremely good good tempo riding not under any real pressure he's certainly not in the red zone here and he's waiting to see if anybody can catch him and looking at these faces down here these boys aren't riding anything like as comfortably as Ivan Basso we caught a brief glimpse there of Gilberto Simoni, the little man who climbs so well. Here he is, but he's not getting closer at the minute. Well, he's not getting any younger either because he's going to be 35 years of age at the end of this season, and I think he may well be looking at uh, no longer being a major challenger, although he must certainly, I think, improve, Phil, once we get into the big mountains in a couple of days' time because he is still a man to be counted on in the Giro d'Italia, and he bases his whole season on this event. Well, the crowd at the finishing line are watching this now and they're seeing Ivan Basso strike a big blow here for the Italians as he moves forward. Here we go back to Tom Danielson, who's uh, certainly doing a ride here to try and keep Paolo Savadelli in the thick of the action. Savadelli off to such a great start in that first week. Uh, but here is his first big test today and I have to say he's not passing it. This is Damiano Cunigo, 10 seconds back. Hasn't been caught by the others yet. Well, he's still holding on. He's the man who set this move up here for Ivan Basso, but it's causing a little bit of consternation a little bit further down. There you can see Ivan Basso, two kilometres to go now. He will be laying the foundations, Phil, here to a very serious challenge to the Giro d'Italia this year. A lot of riders being caught out by the severity of of the work done by this team, Team CSC, in the early kilometres. They're basically the guys who blew the race apart on this final 12-kilometre ascent. Well, by the end of this day, we'll have done 1,200 and uh, a bit kilometres of this year's Giro, and it looks as though it's the first serious move to grab hold of that Malia Rosa, because we've seen a number of changes in the opening few days of this race and swapping around of that jersey, but this is a mountain top finish, and all of the so-called climbers have made their moves here, and Basso is proving he's got the best move, I think. Well, you see the challengers are all having to depend on their teammates here this afternoon. Simone is having to depend on Pipoli, a little bit further back, Salvadelli is having to depend on Tommy Danielson from Durango, Colorado. They're all having very difficult first days in the mountains, but you never know, with a long race like this, three weeks in length, everything can change. That looks like Andrea Noe was there also with Paolo Salvadelli and the Tommy D group. Well, the crowd quite thick up here, but it's a little bit chilly. Take a look at the crowd because they're well wrapped up as we get up to the dizzy heights of uh, approaching 5,000 feet above sea level. Remember, it's, uh, it's not really summer just yet. The trees are managing to come into leaf, though, as we try to find the riders. You can see by the wind up here, too, it's quite a cold wind. 
It's because of those trees. In fact, we're getting a little bit of picture breakup coming up from the motorbike alongside Ivan Vassa. He's now starting to show the face of pain coming through there. He now knows he's got a chance to get the victory. And all he's thinking about, trying to get that spectator away from the back of him. That really riles a rider's concentration. 23 seconds now to Kunigo. That is important for, for this man at the front, Ivan Vassa, to try and get as much time. Once he's seen the gap, Phil, he will try and put down the hammer. Well, he's certainly seen the kite, and that's a kilometre to go. And he's going to be feeling pretty good now because Ivan Basso, third overnight, he's riding to La Malia Rosa. And there's still an awful long way to go in this year's Giro d'Italia. And Ivan Basso is proving a point here. He's got the legs, it seems. It's the first chance we've really seen him since this race began. He's followed every move, he's made no mistakes. Cunigo started it, it looks as though Ivan Basso is going to finish it. A stage win is on the cards now, and Amalia Rosa as well. Well, you know, this man started the season off very well by winning the Criterium Internationale. I think he went back to try and help his teammates Jens Voigt and Bobby Julik do well in that event, but as it happened, he was the man who came up with the win on stage two and took the overall lead and went on to win. That was the foundations of a very good, solid start to the season. A little bit further back, Gilberto Simone still getting the help there of Leonardo Pipoli. Team mechanic leading out there, just shouting out encouragement. A short stage today at four hours, but a very severe stage. And we're going to have a very clear picture now, Phil, at the end of the day on just who is going to be the challengers for the win of this three-week race. Well, with mountains and mountains galore still to come, this was to be all about this one final climb today. And that's where the leaders unleashed their fury. And he sped eagle the race field here in those four hours. Much more damage than yesterday when it was a seven-hour day. These are the remnants of the chase group now, and Cunigo is back in this group. Well, Gutierrez has, in fact, come up. He was also put under a little bit of difficulty. He's ridden himself back up to Cunigo there, and he too now will be riding fairly high up in the overall standings this afternoon. But Basso is a man who has really put down the hammer. Well, this has been quite a remarkable day, I must say, today. And Ivan Basso is... Uh, is facing, if he intends to try and defend this lead for 14 days, that's two weeks of racing still ahead of these riders. Cunigo and Gutierrez, Cunigo still working. He knows the danger here of every second uh, could be building into minutes in the days that lie ahead, so they've got to keep on to uh, Basso. So too Peepley looking at uh, Silmoni here and saying, come on, just got to hold my wheel. In fact, Peepley is the stronger of those two. Yeah, he's just thinking, well, you know, you're supposed to be the leader, you're supposed to have the power. He probably would like to try and fly himself if he could, but his job this afternoon is to make sure that Gilberto de Simone doesn't lose too much time. I think uh, that is Gianpaolo Caruso going there for Liberty Seguros. This is Danilo De Luca going forward. You know, De Luca, Phil, although he's a man who was dropped in the early part of this climb, does not look to me like a man who is really suffering. I think he's got himself back into some kind of rhythm. But this now is going to be a big victory for Ivan Basso because at 150 metres to go, nobody's going to see this man again. Well, as we head up towards the top of the Paso Lanciano, just over a hundred miles of racing in just over four hours. It was a fast, flat ride till they got to the mountain. Ivan Basso not only claims the stage win, but he'll be looking for the Malia Rosa as well. When he wore it last year, he lost it after a couple of days. Big style. This is the race now for second place. It looks though like Gutierrez is going to take on Damiano Cunigo, and I don't think Cunigo is going to bother to try and resist the sprint because he's not going to get the better of the rider from Fonac. That's a good result for Jose Gutierrez. He'll be right up there as well. Or is Cunigo going to have a go? Yes, he is. And has he got the legs? Yes, he has. He gets second on the line. And Gutierrez will come in same time. Shakes his head. I think that tells us a lot. It certainly does. Uh, next man to come in, just trying to see who this is coming up to the line. This will be Caruso from Liberty Seguros. But look at the time gaps. He's crossing the line at 45 seconds, and we're still waiting for Gilberto Simoni. And that was a good ride by Caruso, too. As we look down the home straight here, and the crowd must be freezing up here right now. Is this Seller coming up? Seller should be coming up now. He's done a good ride, then. He it? certainly has ridden himself back into this race. Looking back, I could just see the yellow jersey of Sonier Duval coming in. These are the time gaps, though. 107 for Seller. And Gilberto Simone is going to lose himself a massive time this afternoon. He can hardly stay on the wheel Can't. there of Pipoli, and he's losing a minute and 18 seconds. Well, Mr. Consistent is Gilberto Simone. Seems in modern times to have been on the podium at the final of the Giro d'Italia more times than anyone else. 
is having trouble on this first serious day in the mountain. Ruggiano coming through quite good as De well. De Luca just making it, one and a half minutes for him. Hear the cheers I, for him, he's such a popular guy. I think he rode very sensibly, didn't panic at all. There's Julio Perez in uh, second position there, and of course the man who a lot of people believe is going to be the big challenger a little bit later on in the season, the revelation of last year, Ruggiano. Yes, Perez once lost his teeth in the Tour of Italy. A new set in today as he comes up towards the finish. The clocks, though, are indicating big time gains here by uh, Ivan Basso. He's going to be in the pink jersey for sure, and he's going to have quite a nice little lead, I think, over the field. Well, he certainly has. I'm looking now to see where, in fact, is uh, Tommy Danielson. This might be Tommy Danielson just coming up, and here, a little bit further down, is Gonchar. And out of the pink jersey for sure now, and Basso certainly is in. There is Savadelli too, he's had a rough day today. Tough day in the saddle for a lot of riders this afternoon. We'll see some serious changes in the overall classification. There's Gonchar. Not a bad ride, though. 2.34, he loses, and he will lose the, yellow jer the pink jersey as well. There's the result of the stage. Basso, Cunigo, as we saw it, Gutierrez, Caruso, Mazanti was in fifth place for... Uh, uh, Panaria and Pipoli just bringing home his captain at Simone who finished a minute 15 back that's a huge loss for Gilberto Simone because uh, even when they come head to head in the time trial I'm not sure you pull that sort of time back on Ivan Basso who's going to feel pretty happy this is round one of the presentations for him now because next time up he's going to get the Malia Rosa by a minute and 34 seconds Gutierrez is now second Cunigo is up from 11th to 3rd. Savadelli is still there, but look at the gap, 2.35. Honshaw out of pink and down now, 2.43 back. De Luca holds 6th place. There's the pink jersey, Ivan Basso, the new leader of the Giro d'Italia. Well, he's a long way to go to the finish, 14 days to be precise. So after the Battle of the Paso Lanciano, there's a little pleasure in store now. It's a flat coast ride here for the riders as it's now Monday in the Giro d'Italia and two weeks to the finish in Milano. Well, the riders still head, heading down the Adriatic coast, a little bit lumpy towards the second part of the course as they head into the town of Termoli. And that last part of the course is ideal to split up the race and maybe see a breakaway succeed because so far the breakaways haven't had much luck. And as we join the action here, approaching the finish, the breakaways are still not having much luck because they're being pulled back all of the time here by a very vigilant peloton, always under the escort of CSC as they scrap now for what will be another sprint finish here in the Giro d'Italia. Two days to go to the second rest day. Well, that's Matty White there just having a go in that group. Uh, number nine there, you can see a great scrapper, a good fighter, Matty White, looking to try and get himself the victory here this afternoon. But again, it looks as if, in fact, this is Case de Pagna, Lille Baleares, sending somebody off the front. There's been a lot of attacks here. Credit Agricole trying to get themselves up with a move as well. Still 187 riders left in the Giro d'Italia. The biggest name going out so far, of course, right at the beginning, was Alessandro Pataki. Well, that's Alessandro Bocharov in second place there, but you can see the main field very attentive, keeping it all together. Lamprey may be looking for a win again this afternoon by Daniamo Cunigo. He will try and get himself a few time bonuses. There's the pink jersey firmly on the shoulder there of Ivan Basso after a sterling performance yesterday. And as the sun goes down there over the Adriatic, as they race towards the finish here, it's a beautiful day, blue skies galore, a sprinter's delight, watch out for Robbie McEwen, he's looking for a third win, don't forget, I think it's a third win, I can't remember now. I think he'll be looking for a fourth win, actually, one of three already? two, four and six. <laughs> Well, uh, Robbie's uh, a man who will be in there. He will have suffered yesterday on the big mountain passes, but, of course, he'll be thinking about the win here this afternoon inside the Ultimo Kilometro, the last kilometre. And I'm just looking to see, I think it was, again, the pale blue jerseys of Team Milram on the front. Well, watch out for McEwen. He's got that Ciclamino jersey on because he's got a good lead at the moment in the points competition, although he won't take it all the way to the finish. He will go home. He's made that quite clear. Once again, we're being treated to a lead-out by Milram and... Uh, Ongarato seems to be the man they lead out for, but I don't know why, because he never gets anywhere in the sprint. Well, you can see that maybe they're just practising for where Alessandro comes back for the uh, Tour de France later on in the season. That might be the idea for them, but you can see they're all over the road, hugging the barriers there. Vakas up there into about fourth place. Paolo Bettini nicely placed as well. 
Well, the little rider on the left in green is Botcherov. He's still there. And there's Robbie McEwen, three rides behind Botcherov. So at 250 metres, McEwen's got a long sprint. He's moving to the left of our picture now as he starts to rock and roll once again, McEwen. But it's Vakas who's trying to get there first this time. The 24-year-old Lithuania, I think, might have done that right on the line. It looked like it was an AG to our colour. Yep. The quick step Patini rider. thinks he's got it. Patini, Patini thinks he's won it. He's got his hands up in the air. It's going to be a photo finish, that one. There was a T-Mobile rider right up there as well. I think we'll have to uh, wait for that one, Phil. I tell you what, when we see that in slow motion, I don't. Th I think Patini's trying to play to the judges there. It didn't look close enough. Uh, well, they're congratulating him. Well, we're going to find yeah. out. Uh, he's not sure, he's not sure. He thinks he's got it. Well, Very uh, close on the line there. Let's, let's have, have a look. look. Here we go. Well, it's Vakas there, who's the man leading it out. But look at the acceleration. There's McEwen over on the right-hand side trying to get himself in on this. Bettini, ideally placed, is waiting now to come up through the inside. I think that's Philippe Gilbert right up there as well. The door has opened. The T-Mobile rider is Pollock again. Now oh, this is going to be when we start the lunch. Oh, he's miles off. Well, he's nowhere near the line. <laughs> he's lost <laughs> it by a half a wheel. He I... still thinks he's won. Well, he must have closed his Look eyes. Pollock. He Pollock's knows upset. he didn't get it. And Thomas Vakas in the middle there looking across to say, well, did I or didn't I? Now, just look at this here. He's a big, strong rider. You know, Vakas is a rider who rides very normally on the track. He looks down under his shoulder to see if he's got the win. Well, I think there's no doubt about that. I think Bettini's congratulating the fact he's got second place because there's no way he's won that. <laughs> no, Have another look. No, definitely. Uh, he, he put his head down in the lunge for the line and I think he thought that he got it, but I would say that goes to Vakus by probably almost a quarter of a wheel. And Vakus, a former time trial champion and road race champion of Lithuania, gets the victory. There it is. And he gets it, of course, in the same time as everybody else. McEwen made the run, look good, slipped back into fourth place. Gilbert is sprinting well. Another top seven finish for him.